Welcome to the launch of the Global Assassination Monitor. We are here today initiating a second phase of our Assassination Witness program. To hear more about the objectives of this program and the purpose of the campaign, we're going to hear from the words of our director, Mark Shaw. In 2020, the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime launched the Assassinations Witness Project and the accompanying Faces of Assassination book. And the aim of this project is to keep assassinations in the public consciousness and to contribute to the global effort to make the work of anti-corruption activists, lawyers, journalists, human rights defenders and others around the world safer. And we bear witness to the victims of organized crime and we hope to contribute with responses to this horrific crime. Since the launch of the book, we have developed a global database of assassinations to ensure that there's a reliable and regular means to monitor what is regrettably becoming a global phenomenon. The Global Assassinations Monitor is a disaggregated data collection project that uses open source data to compile information on assassinations. And we've been documenting cases of hits in South Africa, for example, since 2015. And we've now expanded that methodology to demonstrate the global scale of the crime and to create irrefutable evidence around which action can be demanded from states and multilateral bodies. The Assassinations Monitor marks a new phase in the Global Initiative's Assassinations Witness Campaign. And raising awareness of the number of assassinations globally exposes wider societal ills that bring about weaponized violence in the first place. Assassinations or contract killings, as we define them in our research, are a mechanism frequently used strategically by criminal groups and corrupt networks to achieve political, economic and criminal outcomes. They're often closely intertwined with the work of organized crime, either because they're ordered by criminal groups to protect their turf or supply chains, or because organized crime provide a pool of practitioners, literally the hitmen, that can then be used against in our particular area of concern, civil society members. And what our research shows is that assassinations are a problem everywhere, targeting multiple people, of course, also people within the criminal economy, in both the developed and developing world, in rural communities and in urban areas, and linked to a range of different illicit and gray markets. And we can see how they are a dangerous way of silencing those who take a stand and threaten to challenge the status quo, or those whose job is to investigate and dismantle criminal activities. So the negative impacts are severe. Assassinations weaken society and the economy, they undermine democratic processes, and they create great fear in many societies. And despite these pernicious effects, assassinations, because of the difficulty of doing so, is an understudied topic, in particular how contract killings are linked to the works of organized crime. And through this program and by providing information on the role of organized crime and the role of organized crime in, in arranging hits, we hope to shed light on the patterns and dynamics behind killings and to support responses to the killing in particular of civil society actors. And we are doing this by remembering the stories of journalists, environmentalists, human rights defenders and others who are killed including by those who stand up for transparency and public integrity in the face of violence. But we also look at people in the criminal economy who have been targeted and the impact on the wider social media where they are active. Thank you very much for attending the meeting today. We value your contribution and thank you for supporting our campaign. I'm Ana Paula Oliveira, an analyst at the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime, and I'm here today to discuss the Global Initiative's forthcoming report, Killing in Silence, Monitoring the Role of Organized Crime in Contract Killings. So here today with me, I have the, my colleague and co-author of the report, Nina Kaiser, Senior Analyst at the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. We have to discuss with us this report, Michelle Foley, who works for Frontline Defenders, Andrew Caruana Galizia, co-founder of the Daphne Caruana Galizia Foundation, and Fiona Marshall, Secretariat to the Committee, Compliance Committee at the ARUS Convention. Welcome everyone and thank you for joining in this discussion today. While assassinations may not be new, the degree to which they are utilized, most notably at local level, 
is reminiscent of mafia-like violence, that is the use of targeted killing or the threat thereof to obtain political or economic gain. In June 2020, the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime launched the Assassination Witness Project. The aim of this project is to draw public attention to the fact that, across the world, assassinations are used as a means of criminal governance. Those who fight for truth, transparency, and public integrity face grave threats of violence and death. As part of the Assassination Witness Project, we've been gathering data on assassinations from across the world. In many places, assassinations have become a daily occurrence. The Global Assassination Monitor shows the geographic spread of the phenomenon. We have seen cases in virtually every continent around the globe. In total, the Global Assassination Monitor recorded more than 2,700 cases of assassinations and attempted assassinations in more than 80 countries during 2019 and 2020. This is the first global database of contract killings. Dirk Wiersum, a well-known lawyer on the Dutch criminal law circuit who has spent his career fighting for the underdog. He was acting lawyer for a state witness in a case against a group of individuals who were accused of five murders between 2015 and 2017. Two of the accused are thought to be part of a drug ring that controls one third of the cocaine trade in Europe. They were considered Europe's most wanted fugitives by Europol. It was early in the morning on 18 September 2019 in the residential neighborhood of Buitenvelder at Amsterdam. Dirk was walking to his car when a young man gunned him down before fleeing the area. The news of Dirk's assassination made international headlines and was seen as an attack on the rule of law in the Netherlands. It also started a conversation about the safety of lawyers and key witnesses in the country. A newspaper article said that the killing marked the beginning of a dark new phase in the country. The case of Versen illustrates a couple of really important dimensions of the problem. Firstly, it shows how contract killings occur everywhere, even in places considered safe, where democracies are consolidated and stable and the rule of law is really strong. Um, secondly, it also shows how assassinations can really transcend national boundaries and be coordinated by syndicates sometimes operating outside national borders. So in the case of Versen, for example, it's really believed that his assassination was due to his work as a lawyer for a key witness working and cooperating in a case brought against a Dutch Moroccan crime boss and his syndicate, who is alleged to operate and control the drugs trade in the Netherlands and Belgium. It was after the death of Derek that an icon of Dutch journalism got involved in the case, Peter R. de Vries. Peter used to say, on bended knee is no way to be free. He had it tattooed on his leg. As someone who spent his working life fighting injustice and not want to shy away from a confrontation, it was for these reasons that Peter stepped into his investigation. But like Dirk before him, his involvement in this case put a target on Peter. And in July 2021, he was shot five times as he walked to his car. The dark new face has certainly arrived. Criminal groups opt to use assassinations for their own interest and this could be for a variety of reasons, such as the control of the illicit supply chain, the control over the territory. Some criminal organizations might be involved in assassinations not by ordering the direct the killing, so not on their interest, but offering hitmen for hire for those who are willing to pay for the service. They are then monetizing their capacity for violence by offering a pool of trained killers, which is then reverted against civil society groups. The victims would often be people opposing corruption, opposing criminal networks, and they are targeted because of it. The analysis we have completed for the Global Assassination Monitor have reviewed some of these patterns and trends across the globe. We've seen that killings are highly clustered around geographic hotspots, often in places associated with high levels of criminal activity. In the Americas, for example, we've seen 
high number of cases in Colombia, Mexico, El Salvador. We also found how threats play a major role in the dynamics and symbolism of contract killings. Threats that can be manifested in the publication of names in hit lists and also with assassinations of uh, uh, high profile figures. Finally and uh, importantly, the findings reveal the role played by state in also enabling this environment for contract killings. Um, and this is what this database is about, to enable the understanding of assassination as a global phenomenon and also to enable understanding it by the lens of criminal governance. So in this video, we talked about the main findings of our report with a focus on the target groups. Um, but as we said in the video, we have different clusters. And what really struck Nina and I when we were conducting this research is really the extent of the problem. And I think Nina can talk about a little bit more how the data really that we gathered showed how pervasive is contract killings globally. Yeah, so what was mentioned in the video already is that um, it is a truly global phenomenon, right? We found um, cases in virtually every continent. Um, but we also found that this is only a fraction, like the data we gathered is only a fraction of what is happening out there globally. Um, that our database has two layers. So the first layer is a global database, which draws on regional and global news sources. And the second layer is a national database, which draws on national news sources. For the global database, we just recorded every event that was reported on, so it covers every country. For the national database, we looked at 10 selected countries. And comparing um, what we found um, was that the discrepancy between global reporting and national reporting is tremendous. So um, for these 10 countries alone, we found that 340 cases were reported for the, were reported on, on the global news, whereas there were additional 2,000 cases um, that were reported on national news. And um, Yes, and if you if you would add more local sources, there would probably be more. Um, so that is that is saying that essentially on a global scale, there is a great underreporting. So that is on the on the issue of the quantity. So we don't actually know the exact scale of the problem. Um, on the qualitative side, but that has been mentioned before, is that we found that the assassinations clusters, so they are the geographic clusters, um, but also that they cluster around certain target groups. So some groups of people are more vulnerable to assassinations than others, that they cluster around certain motives, um, they cluster on certain methods, um, so for, for example, the use of firearms, and they cluster um, around certain perpetrator groups. So some groups are more likely to perpetrate assassinations than others. And we're going to go through all these parts of information that we found in our report in the videos today. But I think, importantly, we're going to focus in those target groups that are more vulnerable in the beginning. And local community has been the most affected group globally. In virtually all the continents that we recorded cases, local community was the, the, the category that had higher number. And we're going to ha have a video on that. Amilcingo is a small town in the state of Morelos. It's 120 kilometers south of Mexico City. It was the hometown of Nahuatl indigenous activist and radio presenter, Samir Flores Soberanes. Samir, along with other activists in the area, was a long-standing opponent to two new thermoelectric plants and a 150 kilometer natural gas pipeline which were being proposed by a new company called Proyecto Integral Morelos. They feared the contamination of the local water supply and the impact it could have on the health and livelihood on the most indigenous communities. If we look at the Global Assassination Monitor database, across the world, the local community target group has the highest number of recorded victims. In this group, we have members of indigenous communities community leaders and activists. The Americas, where Samir lived, has the highest number of recorded cases within the local community target group, with 32%. One of the common reasons for the assassination of those in the local community target group is their campaigning to protect the environment. This often materializes from a mega development project backed by governments and international financial institutions. In early February, just days before the public referendum, gunman enters Samir's property and shot him twice in the head. A few days before his killing, Samir challenged government representatives at the public meeting. 
It was this confrontation that the people in defense of land and waterfront, an organization which Samir belonged, said led to his murder. It was a political assassination. The lack of transparency during the tender process and the failure to consult local communities can often lead to conflict with those trying to protect their local environment. In the protest that followed Samir's murder, protesters held signs saying, Samir lives, justice for Samir, and Samir didn't die. The government killed him. Those behind these killings, the masterminds, often remain unknown. Companies that collude with politics and organized crime are often seen as responsible for the threats and violence against land defenders. It is organized crime that is often contracted by corrupt companies to actually deliver the threats or carry out the killing. Assassinations are a business model in places where natural resources are abundant and where those in the local community, like Samir, are trying to protect their lands. After Samir's death, the thermoelectric plants and the gas pipelines were suspended. The judge ruled it violated local community rights. But despite the initial victory, local activists still live in fear due to a climate of impunity. And more than a year after Samir's assassination, there still hasn't been any substantial advance in the investigation. It's really striking how big is this target group, Michelle, and I think we've been working a lot in frontline defenders with these issues of defenders being killed. So how these findings relate to your daily work and how do, why do you think that this target group represents such a, a big portion of our database? Thanks, Anna. Yeah, the, the targeting of local community leaders certainly rings true with the work that we're doing at Frontline Defenders and particularly the, the HRD Memorial Project, which is a project, um, while initiated and coordinated by Frontline Defenders, is a joint project uh, together with Amnesty International, Global Witness, and at the local level, a number of local partners, national partners in the countries where the killings and targeting of human rights defenders is the most prolific, so namely Colombia, Mexico, the Philippines, Afghanistan. There's, you know, there's a number of countries where the vast majority of the killings are taking place. And within that context, you know, in 2020, so last year, we saw we recorded 331 human rights defenders killed because of their peaceful work. Um, and it's particularly stark that 69% of those 331 defenders were working on land, environmental and indigenous people's rights. Um, and even coupled with that, 26% of that overall figure were working specifically on indigenous people's rights, which I think is, is, incredibly, is an incredibly stark figure because indigenous people only make up approximately 6% mm -hmm. of the global population. So they're really disproportionately represented in the figures. And I guess then the question is why? Why are local communities, um, local community leaders so disproportionately targeted? Um, and I think the va we would see that the vast majority of the killings take place in the context of, of land grabbing and um, the extraction and exploitation of, of natural resources. So the defenders working on land, environment and indigenous people's rights are really vulnerable and exposed in, in that area. So whether the indigenous peoples or the local community leaders, they're living in rural territories that are really rich in natural resources. Um, and by you know, protecting their lands, and protecting their territories, they come into conflict with really powerful actors, whether that be mega projects, whether that be drug trafficking, where that, you know, by protecting their lands and, and protecting their communities, they become vulnerable and exposed. Lastly, we can't speak about the, the killings of human rights defenders around the world without calling out the, the really dire situation in Colombia, where in 2020, together with the HRD Memorial Partners, El Programa Somos Defensores, we verified and gathered information on the killing of 199 human rights defenders, um, which is, you know, an extraordinary number um, and, and accounts for 56% of the global figure. Um, and together with the, the global, the, the global um, factors that influence this, such as land, environment um, and indigenous rights, we also have the, the Colombia specific factors where the, um, the peace accords, which were signed in November 2016, were introduced and key provisions 
um, have not been implemented properly by the Colombian state and defenders in the rural departments have been left exposed because they are in they're being left alone to implement and to um, promote the, the peace accords to their communities and they're facing backlash from drug traffickers, from um, neo-paramilitary groups who have assumed the, the space that the FARC, the demobilization of the FARC have left and really the state should have assumed that, that those positions of power at the time and just lastly, I suppose, with 2020 as well, we have the added dimension of, of COVID-19. And for human rights defenders at the local level, one of the key protection mechanisms that they have is being able to move around, is to avoid threats. Um, they move from village to village. They're not in the same village two nights in a row so that they can't be tracked and they're not, they're not vulnerable. Um, but with the implementation of restrictions, this has exposed them in many ways. And the restrictions aren't just implemented by states, but they're implemented by the neo-paramilitaries. So these new armed groups are implementing their own restrictions and um, mobility restrictions, which mean that they can continue to conduct their illicit activities while controlling the space. And essentially, those people in the end are easily targeted, right? In our research, we also found that the difference between cases in the year of 2019 hasn't really dropped as one could expect with the COVID and then uh, restriction on borders. So that really rings a bell to our research as well. And Fiona, I, I assume that I can ask you because we've touched upon a little bit on this in our report and looking at the legal frameworks that are in place to protect those specifically land defenders, as Michelle was saying, is as the most vulnerable groups. Um, what are the legal frameworks that exist to protect them? Thank you, Anna. So I would like to focus on two instruments that are particularly focused on the rights of local communities, because uh, today we're talking specifically about the rights of local communities. And these two instruments have at their heart giving a voice to the affected people. Uh, this is the Aarhus Convention and the Escazú Agreement. So first of all, I will mention the Escazú Agreement. The Escazú Agreement is a very recent international agreement. It was it entered into force in April of this year. It is specifically focused on countries of the Latin, Latin America and Caribbean. There are 33 countries who can join this agreement. So far, 12 have become parties. And it has in its provisions very specific articles about giving a voice to the public who are affected by particular projects and activities. And one of the powerful provisions are, is its Article 9, which is about the right to protect environmental human rights defenders. And that is a binding obligation that imposes on the parties to the agreement to make sure that people are not persecuted for trying to exercise their rights to protect the environment. And it also imposes obligations on parties to investigate and punish at any such, such actions. This, the Escazú Agreement, as I mentioned, is specifically focused on the Latin American and Caribbean region. The other instrument, which is the instrument that I work for, is the Aarhus Convention. The Aarhus Convention is an older instrument. It has been in force since 2001. It is open globally. It also has as its heart the giving a voice to those people who are affected by activities uh, that affect the environment. It gives the right for the public to have access to information, to be able to participate in decisions and to get access to justice. And it also contains a binding obligation ensuring that no one is persecuted, harassed or penalised for trying to exercise their rights under the Convention. And we have seen, sadly, that this is a very much a growing issue for the parties to the Convention. And in recognition of this, actually, just two weeks ago, the parties uh, established a new rapid response mechanism to protect environmental defenders under the Convention. So this is the first time, and it's the first mechanism actually that exists anywhere in the world, which will give a rapid response mechanism to, to protect environmental defenders. Thank you for bringing that, Fiona. And what we were also seeing in our research is that different target groups, not only local communities, are precisely targeted because of their work. And those assassinations might 
see uh, in the smaller scales compared to local communities where their impacts are severe. And so we want to look at specific cases of media workers, specifically of journalists in the next video. Malalai Maivand, a journalist and civil societies activist in Afghanistan, passionate about women's rights, she had spoken about the challenges of being a female journalist in the country. Towards the end of 2020, as the then government of Afghanistan and the Taliban were not Qatar negotiating the future of the country. There was a view of violence and assassination taking place across the country. According to the Global Assassination Monitor database, attacks on media workers such as journalists, filmmakers and social media creators accounted for only 7% of recorded cases globally. A figure people may find surprising given the headlines these cases usually make. Once again, the Americas and Asia are the most affected continents with about 44% cases in each. This reflects the trend of targeting those reporting on organized crime and conflict. In December, Malalai, who was a reporter for Enikas Radio and TV, was picked up at home by her driver, Muhammad Tahir, who was taking her to work in Jalalabad. It was at this moment when unidentified masked gunmen opened fire, killing both Malalai and Muhammad. The provincial governor said, that assailants had fled the area. Malalai was the third journalist to be killed in Afghanistan that month. A message was being said that it's not safe to report in the country. Armed conflict cases, like Malalai, have a hugely negative impact on civil society. For example, we've seen that the violence in Afghanistan led media workers and activists to self-censor. The murder of journalists in Afghanistan continued into 2021 when three female journalists, also from Enikas Radio and TV, were assassinated in two separate attacks in Jalalabad. Assassinations perpetrated by armed groups were included in the database if these groups were involved in illicit trade and the killings were targeted contract killings. These cases illustrate the nexus between crime and conflict. The methods and objectives used by armed groups are very similar to those used by mafia-style groups. Assassinations are strategically instrumental in the elimination of obstacles. Such was the case with Malalai. What's also tragic is that Malalai's mother, who was also an activist, was also assassinated by an unknown gunman just five years before. As part of this Assassination Witness project, we published last year in 2020 a book called Faces of Assassination, Bury Witness to the Victims of Organized Crime. The, the aim of this book was to highlight individual stories of brave people who have died because of their stance against organized crime. We assembled 50 beautiful stories of people. You know, if you look at any of these cases, such as Berthe Cáceres, Jan Kusiak, Ahmed Vela, they all show the truly huge impact that assassinations have in societies. So it's not only about the loss of a life, but the damage this, this loss of life has in the communities, in the families, family members, it creates a future of fear, it silences people and it really takes a toll to rebuild this resilience. And we've all seen footages of messages being left in bodies, names being circulated in hit lists. All of this is designed to enforce silence and this future of fear is so harmful to the society and to the state. And the data gathered by the Global Monitor aims to show that. When these threats are made to a community member, they are clearly intended to intimidate and impose a culture of widespread fear within that community. Some organized criminal groups show extreme and public displays of violence, such as beheadings and the dismembering of bodies. Messages left on bodies, including the claiming of responsibility, along with evidence of extreme violence, carry a high degree of symbolism. Again, these acts aim to sow fear in rival organized crime gangs, the authorities and communities. The culture of fear created by organized crime 
especially in the context of political assassinations, has a serious impact on the quality of democracy. With each killing, not only do you lose a serving politician, but you also reduce the number and quality of future candidates willing to stand for political office. The electoral candidate pool is diminished. Voters, out of fear, vote for corrupt officials or just don't vote at all, which perpetuates the cycle of violence and impunity. Looking at this video, I think I want to, we wanted to highlight two important points, at least in our view from our research, is the fact that the assassinations of media workers, specifically journalists, have a huge impact in um, democratic institutions and in the democracy rule of law. So Andrew, if I can turn to you and ask, why do you think it's so important to, for us to highlight those cases and how they, these assassinations really contribute to this culture of fear that we've been talking about and the, this widespread sense of impunity? There are, I mean, uh, my thinking about this is obviously shaped by, by what I went through. And um, right after my mother's assassination, we realized that we had to separate the fact that our, our mother was murdered from the fact that one of the country's most prominent journalists was murdered. And the importance, you know, the, the reason people needed to care about it was not because she was our mother, but because she was the only person in Malta at the time investigating corruption and holding the government to account. And why is it important to, to draw attention to this? There are, there are two reasons I can think of. The first is one that, that Nina mentioned, which is that when a prominent journalist is assassinated or, or when a prominent politician is assassinated, it, it destroys the pipeline of, of future leaders in journalism or, or politics. Um, and that leaves a permanent, it leaves society or a democracy permanently handicapped. So we had to make it our mission to ensure that something positive came out of my mother's assassination that society's response, rather than one of fear, would be one of courage, and, and that society would grow stronger from what happened. We, we understood immediately that if, if we weren't successful in doing that, um, then society would grow weaker. Um, when something like this happens, it's always a turning point for a country. So. Um, it, it could have either got worse or better, and for a time it, it got worse, and it, it was years before it started to get better, and it's still quite bad. Um, but we know from other examples, uh, such as Russia, um, there, are, there are many others I could mention, that when a, when a prominent journalist like Anna Politovskaya is assassinated, you can, you can always tell this is when everything reaches a point of no return and where any hope for a democratic transition uh, disappeared completely. Um, and we knew there was that risk in Malta. And in fact, the, the public inquiry into my mother's assassination found that Malta was on the way to becoming what it called an entrenched mafia state. And that if it weren't for my mother's assassination, that would have been Malta's future. And so it wasn't the assassination that saved the country, it was society's response to the assassination that changed the country's destiny. Um, and the, the second thing, so this is all, this is all future oriented. I mean, this is the sort of, um, this was us as a family trying to understand how, how we could prevent the situation from deteriorating, um, from getting any worse than it already was for us as a family and, and for our country. The second reason is that a, a journalist fulfills, I mean, it's a cliche to say this, this critical role in a country's democracy. Um, and the more prominent a journalist is, the more critical that role is. So my mother's murder, it felt almost like an act of war on the country's democracy. Um, so it, uh, that damage needed to, be re needed to be repaired for the democracy's health. Um, and we knew that no one would automatically fill that gap. You know, there's sometimes this fatalistic attitude um, on, on both the positive and negative spectrums. Either 
um, there's nothing we can do, the situation is too bad, or this is so bad, society will have to respond, and this cannot get any worse. And I see those responses as, as equally fatalistic. Um, actually, no, you have to decide to respond. You have to decide to, to find the courage to speak out. And, and you have to find ways to fill the hole in, in democracy that that journalist death left. And there were a lot of people who approached us, you know, saying that, that me and my brothers should literally step in, into the shoes of our mother and, and turn to journalism and take on her work. Um, but actually, at that point, there are other, other responses that, that are actually more powerful, um, giving journalists the courage to fill my mother's shoes, giving civil society actors the courage to, to stand up and, and do something about the situation, and giving politicians the, the, the motivation to change things. Um, so so that, that's why, I mean, the assassination of journalists is, is this, you know, the, the other reason there it's so important to respond is that when a journalist is assassinated, especially a journalist investigating corruption, it's a symptom of something deeply wrong in, in the state. Um, so you cannot leave it to the state to respond. Um, the journalists are often the, only become targets once state agencies have already failed. And, and that's something we knew was the case in, in Malta and, and was the case even in other European countries like Slovakia. Um, so, so that's why it's non-state actors who sadly have to take on the responsibility of, of responding to the murder of, of journalists and civil society activists and sometimes even politicians. Thank you for that. I think you touch upon very important points. And one specifically that you mentioned that, uh, you know, the civil society needs to take the shoes and, and pursue this, this, this uh, criminal justice, right? And I do think that it relates to the second point that we wanted to discuss, which is the role of perpetrators and masterminds, because it talks about the, the lack of, of criminal justice and the fight that you have to go through to pursue justice because the absence of a state really undermines those investigatory and prosecution pro processes. So we're going to play a video now that we look at the specific findings of perpetrators and masterminds. On the 18th of September 2020, Lieutenant Colonel Charles Kinnear, a police investigator in Cape Town, was gunned down outside of his home. At the time of his death, he had been investigating a guns-to-gang syndicate in the city and across the country. The investigation into the guns-to-gang syndicate looked at how senior officials in the country's criminal economy were corrupting officials in the central firearms registries to acquire guns that they ordinarily would not have been able to get their hands on. Assassinations are carried out by various means, shooting, stabbing, bombing, beating and others. However, in the majority of cases in the database, that is 71%, the target was shot. Also, the data shows that globally firearms are by far the preferred method. If we break down the data geographically, it shows that it differs greatly from region to region. In the Americas, it's as high as 85%, whereas in Africa, it's much lower, at roughly 55%. But this, of course, was the region which saw the guns to gang scandal that had such a huge impact in South Africa. The investigation by Kinnear and others into corruption at the Central Firearms Registry was part of a bigger investigation which had looked at how guns which had been handed into the police or had been withdrawn from police use had been subsequently sold on to the gangs. Now that had been done by a prominent police officer, also a Lieutenant Colonel, Christian Prinsluer, who had been behind the large-scale transfer of guns into the South African underworld. The guns that Prinsluer sold have been shown to have been used in over a thousand murders and some 1,400 attempted murders. When we think about assassinations, of course, most of our attention is given to the victim. 
but then little is known about the people that are behind the murders. So in the Global Assassination Monitor, when it comes to the ones behind the murder, we have categorized them in two. So the perpetrator, who is the person that carries out the assassination materially, and the mastermind, who is the one ordering the killing. The relationship between the two is guided by some, for, some sort of contract. It could be through material exchange, so the mastermind paying money to the perpetrator in exchange for the killing. You can also have contracts that are involved uh, in a non-monetary exchange. For example, a lower ranking member of an organized criminal group or armed group or a gang or a member of a political party that carries out the killing in order of their superiors. And then rather than money, the perpetrator will receive a reward like an advancement in the organization. In 62% of our cases in the database, information about either the perpetrators or the masterminds was not reported. Where the information is available, the largest category was armed groups at 15%, followed by organized crime groups with 8%, and state representatives at 5%. Individual hitmen who have no link to armed groups or organized crime accounted for 5%. Then we come to the masterminds, where even less information is available. Even in high-profile assassinations, like the Brazilian politician Maria Franco, the Russian journalist Anna Politkovskaya, or the Cambodian activist Chudvuti, the masterminds of these crimes have never been charged. So the question is, why don't we know? This could be for a number of reasons. The country where the assassination took place may have low prosecution rates and high levels of impunity. It could be that the professionalism of the country killers, leaving little evidence, makes it difficult to prosecute the case. But it could also be a lack of police resources. A pattern has emerged within the database that those killings which fall under the personal category tend to provide more information on the perpetrators and the masterminds. This could be due to a lack of professionalism behind the killing or an absence of political connections that can suppress an investigation. So what we've been looking in this, in this part of the research is really how contract killings are designed to, to hide the mastermind and therefore make those assassinations go largely uh, in, unpunished and these people go without being held accountable. And in the face, the, the, the group of cases that we've been following, the Faces of Assassination um, book, the pattern is the same. And I think we've seen, some, we've seen something similar in the Global Monitor, right, Nina? Yeah, the data of the Global Monitor shows a very similar pattern in the sense that um, the perpetrators remain mostly unknown. Um, and even in cases where the perpetrators might be known, um, they're not necessarily prosecuted. Um, and due to the two levels of um, perpetrator, the person or the hitman and the mastermind, even if the hitman is prosecuted, the mastermind often remains hidden. So yeah, the pattern is very similar. And Andrew, do you think this plays a role in the lack of criminal justice, the fact that the mastermind is very difficult to be held accountable? And how do you think this operates in practice? Of course it does. I mean, there are... There are several elements. I mean, there, there are some countries where we see no contract killings, and often that's because there are no professional hitmen, or very few, um, because they, they can't get access to small arms. For example, they can't get access to explosives. Um, and then there are countries where that's, that's not an obstacle, which means there's this thriving market of professional hitmen and uh, searching for a motivation. Um, and, and as soon as someone with a motivation to murder someone arrives, you know, there are, there are no logistical obstacles to, to commissioning a contract killing. Um, in, in certain countries, we're seeing contract killings reappear or, or appear for the first time, such as in, in some European countries. And there, that's a challenge related to often the, the free movement of criminal organizations across borders and, and the free movement of, of explosives and, and light weapons and the inability of police forces to respond to that transnationalization of, of organized crime. Um, but there are, you know, even in cases where the hitmen are apprehended and, and because they are, they are literally paid not to talk about who commissioned them, 
there are other ways of ensuring justice. Often there's a public record of what the journalist was working on before he or she was assassinated, or a public record of what a civil society activist was campaigning against, or what a politician was, was trying to change in, in society. And one of the biggest frustrations is when police don't look at those motivations. Um, and don't try to prosecute individuals who might have been investigated by, by that journalist or, or that civil society activist. Because that's a very effective way of, of breaking impunity in a case, taking a journalist's story seriously and mounting a, a strong investigation um, against, say, the, the, the corruption that might have motivated the murder. Um, and that, that was a very frustrating element in, in my mother's case. And it's still something that, that has yet to be resolved. There, there have still been no, no effective investigations in, into my mother's reporting in, in the years before her death. Um, and I, I, I expect that's also um, related to the fact that most traditional police forces feel obliged to respond to violent crime but don't necessarily feel the same obligation to respond to, uh, to, to what are often called victimless crimes like money laundering and corruption. So a lot of the public pressure will be focused on the violent crime and a lot of that pressure dissipates once the hitmen are, are apprehended and, to, and removed from society. Absolutely, and that's the impunity continues, right? Because before you bring the mastermind, the, there is no criminal justice. And Michelle, do you think the same patterns occur in the cases of defenders? Yeah, definitely, Anna. I think that you know whether it's criminal groups or it's you know corrupt business practices, um, human rights defenders are you know disrupting the economic interests of these groups. And for us, you know, ultimately, it, it goes back to. For, from Frontline's perspective and the HRD Memorial, the responsibility to protect human rights defenders is first and foremost with the state. The state is responsible for in, uh, putting in place uh, protection mechanisms and ensuring their safety. But we, to, to better understand the situation, we need to look more at the, the material authors and the intellectual authors of the crime and, and the criminal um, criminal elements that are that are at play there. And I was really interested to see in the in the GI report and in the video how you're looking at the perpetrators and looking at that dichotomy and um, between the material authors and the intellectual authors, because at the end of the day, they're all criminals and they're all responsible for um, for the crime. Um, and whether the and uh, I suppose what it is is that we need to connect the dots. So we need to follow the money. We need to um, we need to get access to the, the the intellectual authors. And the only way to do that is to to properly investigate the the crimes and to follow the money. And you know, oftentimes uh, we believe that that will lead to more legitimate uh, business interests and and corrupt politicians. You know, so it, there the the. The sad reality is that there, the impunity is convenient for some people um, and the, the fact that the killings happen and they're not investigated properly is, you know, is purposeful. Exactly, and it creates the perpetuation of assassinations, right? Because if one assassination is not investigated, is not prosecuted, another criminal group will feel that it can do the same and go away with the murder, right? Exactly. Um, I do want to ask you, Fiona, because we are looking at different legal frameworks that protect defenders. Do this, these legal frameworks have any provision that look at the responsibility of non-state actors? Yes, so I will start again with the Escazú and the Aarhus um, Convention and Agreements because they indeed, through the states themselves, impose these obligations. And this comes back to a point that Michelle is just raising. So if we take the Aarhus Convention, its obligation with respect to environmental defenders is placed on the state, but it requires the state to ensure that no person is persecuted or harassed or penalized for trying to exercise their rights. And that means that it also extends to an obligation on, those state, on that state to stop other actors from doing so. So the state that is a party to this convention can find itself in breach of international law because it did not take measures to stop that persecution 
by others. And so I think that's very, um, a very important point for states to be aware of, that even if they are, have, th th their hands are nowhere directly touching what happened, they have an obligation under these international agreements to make sure that no one else does it either. So that is with respect to these two agreements. Now with something that is turning to non-state actors themselves, at the moment in Geneva, there is negotiations going on for a new international agreement that is focused on human rights obligations of transnational corporations and other business enterprises. And that is looking directly at the obligations that could be placed on the corporations themselves. That's still at the negotiation stage, but it may be very interesting to look into it and follow it and be involved in the negotiation of that instrument to make sure that there are sufficient protections brought into there. That's a very interesting point because, as we've seen in the case of defenders in particular, corporations might be involved in those murders, so having them accountable for that, it's an important point. And I think for to finalize the discussion, um, we looked at how the monitor can contribute to all the efforts that everybody here is doing to respond to assassinations and to build a more global um, response to those crimes. So I think we should look at the next video. Contract killings are closely linked to the prevalence of organized crime and the strength of criminal groups. They show ways in which organized crime is embedded in political and economic institutions. Remember, assassinations are used as a form of criminal governance, which aims to exert control. That is the same reason why civil society are so often the targets. The data collected for the Global Assassination Monitor highlights these trends and the ways in which criminal groups operate around the globe, who they target, what illicit markets they operate in, and how they connect to other groups. But ultimately, the Monitor aims to demonstrate the scale of the problem. This is happening in every region and it shows the lethal capacity of organized crime in its drive to silence civil society. The underlying patterns and dynamics of assassinations, which materialize from the data, such as power struggles, corruption, and widespread violence, contributes to the prevalence of assassinations. But it also creates a climate of fear, which organized criminal groups exploit to pursue their illicit activities. A lack of political will and impunity makes assassinations an easy and relatively low risk option. To break the cycle of violence, political will and better enforcement are needed for enhancing the investigations and prosecutions, but we also need to strengthen investigatory and adjudicatory capacities, for example, between the cooperation, between um, enforcement and the prosecution, between regional and national institutions, passing legislation that enable the prosecution of criminal groups, and of course for intelligence. Um, the data collected by the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime aims to be a first step in providing a better picture of the global phenomenon of contract killings. And of course, we can do more. We can improve disaggregate data collection on assassinations. We can enhance our knowledge between methods, for example, the illicit trade in firearms and how it relates to assassinations. We can bolster corporate responsibility when we know that some companies are involved in these killings. We can also engage more civil society groups, engage with state, engage with um, corporations, engage with the judiciary. And above all, we need to give more protection to those who are in the front line. In Culiacán, Sinaloa, Mexico, it's a danger to stay alive. And to do journalism is to walk on an invisible line marked by the bad ones que están en el narcotráfico y en el gobierno, un piso filoso y lleno de explosivos. Esto se vive en casi todo el país. Uno debe cuidarse de todo y de todos. Y no parece haber opciones ni salvación y muchas veces no hay a quien acudir. We also need to tackle root causes and enablers for assassination. So that this environmental that's perfect to contract killings is then ended. The Global Assassination Monitor can be the first small step to making these changes. In terms of 
responses and solutions. I wanted to pick up a few points that we've discussed already today. You mentioned the instruments that are designed to, to hold corporations accountable. Andrew also mentioned the, the question of firearms because you know availability to these people to commit those, those murders. And um, you were mentioning the root causes tracking, um, following the money and all those, all, all those things we can be looking at and be doing together to, to provide the, the right responses to assassination. So Michelle, what do you think that how monitoring by civil society can, can help to, to contribute to those responses? Yeah, thanks, Anna. I think that um, civil society has a, has a really key role to play in monitoring, verifying, gathering data, um, particularly local civil society. So for, from, from the HRD Memorial perspective, um, one of the key successes of the, the HRD Memorial project has been working with local partners because local partners have access to gathering and verifying cases of, of killings of human rights defenders that um, frontline defenders or, or other more, more um, internationally based organizations don't have the access to. So because so many of these killings are taking place in really rural departments or rural territories, um, you know, gaining access to to that information and understanding the context behind those assassinations is really is really complex. Um, so working with local actors is is imperative and local civil society and in addition to their access they also have the trust of the local communities which international organizations governments um even the likes of the OHCHR, or the un uh, office of the high commissioner for human rights can't expect to to gain that trust you know these are these are really rural communities in the in the case of indigenous uh, communities I think you know that trust is really key but I think every level of civil society has a really key role to play so at the very local level you have the people who have access to gathering and verifying the cases at the national level you have the the coordinators of of delivering that information and and gathering it from the different departments and then at the international level you have organizations like like Frontline and like the HRD Memorial Project which can then amplify the voices of more local civil society partners um, to to bring it to decision making spaces to um, to shine a spotlight uh, both you know gaining access to national governments as an international organization is sometimes more easy than it is for, for national organizations you know the the um, the authenticity of an international organization or the um, uh, for want of a, I'm missing a word here, but the, um, the, the profile that an international organization can give to an issue is um, sometimes overlooked by the national actors in that space. So I think civil society has a really key role to play in gathering the data, um, verifying the data and, and bringing about solutions and, and not just data, but like your, your faces of assassination campaign, actually telling the stories of who these people are, because just dealing in numbers and figures isn't enough. It, you know, it's showing the loss to the communities and the societies and, and you know, commemorating the work that these people did and also looking at what their communities are still striving to do and, and to amplify those voices, I think is really, really important. And I think that's something that Global Initiative is definitely doing and that the HRD Memorial is trying to do as well. And I think it's a really interesting space to work in together as well. Thank you. And I think something that you said just now, that looking at their stories, look at what they are doing, it's something that Andrew also mentioned in the case of the journalists. And you mentioned before, Andrew, the necessity of us looking at the, the wider picture. You know, in the case of journalists, frequently they are investigating corruption and organized crime. So how, how, how would we look to these issues to trying to build a criminal justice process in the cases? I mean, to, to go back to what, what Michelle said, um, we, we do need to look at the wider picture around what a journalist or an activist was working on f to break the cycle of impunity. But we also need to do it to turn them into positive role models for everyone else. Otherwise, um, we sometimes see that drug traffickers, hitmen become the role models for society, uh, which is obviously a terrible fate for, uh, for a community. Um, on when it comes to 
responses, so, so how to find justice when the only actor that can deliver justice is the state that is often responsible for the assassination itself, or at the very least for, for being negligent um, when it comes to fulfilling its responsibilities towards, towards journalists and civil society actors. Um, I think there are, there are internal and external responses. So, so Michelle mentioned the, the impact of international organizations and, and how they can help raise the profile of cases. And, uh, and I found that that was critical. And, and the smaller a country is, the more important that is. The larger the country is, the more, the more difficult um, justice is going to be. Mm -hmm. Um, that's the sad reality, and and I have huge respect for for activists who continue to work in in countries like Russia, um, even in Brazil, um, where they're up against a very powerful state and where the the role of international actors is limited. Um, when it comes to smaller countries, the, the external levers are extremely powerful. So if activists can link an assassination. Um, to, to issues which regional or international actors uh, pay very serious attention to, like money laundering or the sale of passports or, or massive corruption in public procurement when actually the state has to respect transnational co competition rules, um, or, or areas which have a security implication like um, transnational arms trafficking, for example, or transnational drug trafficking. Then, then internal actors, domestic actors, can often attract the interests of, of, of very powerful um, external governments or international organizations um, to constantly bring up a specific case in bilateral meetings or multi multilateral settings. And after a few years, it will get extremely tiring for a government uh, who is trying to, which is trying to talk about different issues to constantly have a specific raise, a case being raised in, in every interaction they have with, with external actors. Um, but obviously, to keep up that international pressure, there has to be strong domestic pressure um, because external players have to see that people in that country care about that case, that there are people who, who want to see change and who could, who could actually work to magnify any pressure that's applied externally. I think that engagement between the different actors is really important. And then Fiona, I wanted to hear your opinion on that, how civil society, the governments and um, corporations can work together to, to really put in practice the legal frameworks that exist. Yes, uh, thank you, Anna. I'd also like to add international organisations in there because I think that uh, together each of these have an important role to play. And as we were speaking about before, for civil society to tell the stories through coalitions of civil society so that for those people who are not able to bring a, to have a voice, for example, at the international level, others take their story and share it so that it cannot be forgotten and also those uh, civil society that have an international presence often sit at the table with governments also because these international processes are open to civil society actors as well to raise that voice. Um, I would like to focus on just a few things. We see a very worrying trend across um, governments all over the world of all uh, ends of the political spectrum to start to criticize journalists lawyers and activists as a cheap shot and this is such a dangerous thing because it changes public opinion against these people who are incredibly brave and are not acting in their own interest but in the interest the public interest so this this uh, this trend that we see of politicians making cheap shots this should be something that is stamped down very very strongly um, with respect to states themselves we spoke today a little bit about some of the existing obligations. Of course, those countries that have already signed up to those instruments need to be have pressure put on them to make sure that they do comply with them. But both to the Escazú Agreement, as I mentioned, there's only 12 of the 33 countries in Latin America and, Car and the Caribbean who have so far ratified that instrument. So there is another 21 countries in the region 
that yet need to do so. So this is something definitely that there can be further uh, work done to make sure that more of the countries in that region are coming to the table very soon. With respect to the Aarhus Convention, this convention is open globally. So any UN state can join that convention. So it would be great to see further countries from other regions joining this, this convention as well, so that the people in that country can be protected by the instrument. For, multinet, for other types of international organizations and donor countries, there is so much work to be done in providing funding to civil society, to give a voice to civil society, because often, particularly environmental defenders, are deeply under-resourced. They're doing it out of their conviction and their commitment, but they have very, very little resources. Similarly, lawyers, public interest lawyers, are very under-resourced in most countries. They often act pro bono, doing, acting against very large, well-funded lawyers on the other side for the, the uh, extractive sector companies who are bringing the cases. You may have pro bono lawyers on the other side. So there is really a, a power imbalance there. So providing funding to, to uh, organizations that provide uh, legal support in the public interest is another area. Um, another area is for to prevent um, impunity is judicial training, to make sure that independence of the judiciary is upheld. And we also see a trend, very, very sadly, of increasing encroachments on judicial independence. And this is like the last bastion, if you like. Once your judiciary is no longer independent, then who can how can people be held to account? So for donor countries and for international organizations to be making sure to be working to hold states to, to maintaining judicial independence. So I think that this would be my, um, my three areas that I would like to most focus on. The civil society, international organizations and states actually signing up to these obligations and then uh, supporting those who are trying to exercise their rights under them. They are very important areas indeed. And Nina, we've seen some of these areas, uh, focus areas in our report as well, right? So what is our key messages moving, moving forward to finalize this discussion today? Um, so I think the key messages are quite similar to what you've just mentioned. Um, we have three key messages. Um, one is the role of the state in contract killings and the role of illicit markets as well as the role of threats. Um, the state, as we have seen, plays an important role in the sense that perpetrators are often not investigated or prosecuted, and um, that is due to political influence. Um, therefore, one, one, one point would be to, to have greater independence of judicial bodies. Um, the other part about illicit markets is that we have seen that assassinations cluster around um, certain illicit markets. Um, which is due to them targeting those who work against um, criminal interests, but also them providing the pool of hitmen to others. Um, so, so targeting or dismantling these illicit markets and criminal groups um, could help in, in, in reducing the number of assassinations potentially. And the third part is threats. So um, we, we've seen in many, many reports that actually um, assassinations were preceded by threats that were made to the individual beforehand, but also threats to entire communities. And the threats are not always taken seriously. So our point in our research is to say that the threats need to be taken seriously to provide protection to vulnerable communities. Um, the last point I would like to highlight, and that is what I've mentioned earlier as well, is that um, Little is known about the actual scale of the problem, um, as I've seen, and our data collection is just a first step in that direction, but more data is needed um, on global scale, but also on national and local level um, to understand the dynamics and the scale of the issue. So we are taking steps in that direction in the sense that we are continuing the data collection project. Um, we're aiming to publish on an annual basis data. We are hoping to expand the national data collection um, the, the project now is publication of report, um, but also we will publish the data on a website where it will be accessible to users so they can visualize the data graphically, but also analyze the data and download the information we have collected.
So that's what we are calling for, for global response to assassination, to join in ports with other civil society organizations, with international organizations, with the state to respond and to impede that this continues to grow as a global phenomenon. Thank you for everybody to be here today. It was a pleasure to discuss these issues with you. And I hope we, we move forward with this discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.